time certainly flies by. Well, guys, um, as you guys have noticed on the news, there's a whole impeachment going on with Donald J. Trump. Now, I don't mean to bring a politics, but as we all know, the, when you've been going to church for a while, there seems to be a whole lot of people saying, well, we don't obey the government. We just obey God's government. But we have to ask ourselves the question. Do we have the right to rebel against government? And secondly, um, is there such thing as a God's government and then the world's government as separate? The answer to that is a no. God's government and the world's government is not a separate ordeal. And I think so many people get this so very confused. They think that by rebelling against government and causing some sort of revolution, that they think they're doing God's work. And really, that's not the case. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, not only is it because of the whole controversial thing, um, and Brandon Kemp, hello, God bless, and he says, hey, Blake, man, good to see you. Good to see you too, Brandon Kemp, and I'm very glad that you are supporting me in this. And so, <clears throat> so I want to go ahead and read for you guys in Romans chapter 13, and then we're going to um, work our way to 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, regarding this and basically the the whole subject that i want to deal with you guys is the relation as i would call it the relationship between god and government so that's the title of tonight's um mentor now uh lesson is the relationship between god and government because it is so uh, in the church, it's so confusing. No, uh, more like it's so many people are so very confused when they come to the subject. And plus, I have dealt with many individuals who have said that that they were actually offended by Romans chapter 13. Uh, many times when I have put when it was on the subject of a what was it called a post about the government i would put you know romans 13 1 and i kid you not man despite john 14 6 when jesus says i'm the way the truth the life and then comes to the father except through me romans 13 ends up also um nowadays in many christian circles as one of the most offensive biblical passages of all time and you'll see why why a lot of people don't like Romans 13. You'll you'll see why. But first of all, I want I want to explain the context a bit. So in the book of Romans, Paul deals with the total depravity of men in verses one to three. And then in Romans chapters four to five, he's dealing with justification by faith and how God's love is implemented in that. Then we see in Romans chapter 6 and 7 that how you cannot keep the law because it's impossible to keep the law. And you have to keep the law perfectly. And who could keep the law perfectly? Nobody but the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 5 that I, have, um, that I come not to abolish the law but to fulfill the law and the prophets. And so then you get to – then. Romans chapter um, 8, 9, 10, and 11, and it deals with the whole topic of salvation. Many people believe, well, the whole thing about Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 9 is not dealing with predestination, but it got, but Israel's past. But I would have to argue back and say, yes, it does. It deals a lot with predestination and salvation because then you get to Romans 8 and it says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? So you have to ask the question, who's God's elect? It's the believers. It's those who have been chosen because then first Peter goes on to say that we have been chosen a royal priesthood. 
And so when you're dealing with when you're dealing with Romans chapter nine, you have to also deal with Romans chapter eight. You have to deal with the whole context and the whole context is of salvation. Yes, we see the fact that, you know, Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter nine, 10, 11 has to do with Israel's past, Israel present and Israel's future. But more than that, it deals also with the sovereignty of God and salvation. And especially when you get to Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 35, about who can counsel God. Of course, nobody, because he knows everything. But when you get to Romans chapter 12, you'll notice that what he ends it on, Romans chapter 12, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, you might have to ask, now you might ask the question, well, why would Paul end it on doing good for others? Well, how it connects then Romans chapter 13 makes a lot of sense because one of the one of the type of people we have to do good to is the government. And that's where Paul gets into in Romans chapter 13. So that's why if you're following him along, go to Romans chapter 13 and, and notice this. It's starting in verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. So this is what offends people a lot, because as we know, we don't agree with. And again, I'm going to I'm about to bring a lot of controversial issues to the video. So um, my intention is not to offend people, but we have to deal with these current issues in a biblical matter. A lot of people, when they come to the when they come to this passage they get offended at verse one part one because they're like oh, submit to my government are you kidding me is a, a government that supports abortion and all these things like you you can't be serious right but here's the thing is we submit to the government but however it doesn't mean we have to support everything from the government we don't have to support abortion. We don't have to support gay marriage. We don't have to support all these things. Because if it goes against your biblical conscience, you don't have to support those things. And I would argue, too, we're going to get into Acts chapter 4, but, the, but I'm going to make this point again later on, is that the only way you rebel against government is that they tell you to stop preaching the gospel. That's the only time you rebel against government is if they go against your biblical conscience. So going, going back on to this, why is it that we are to submit to the governing authorities? Why is it that we are to obey policemen? Why is it that we are supposed to obey firemen? Why is it that we are supposed to obey our president? Well, notice what it says in the rest of verse one. For there's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. You see, God is the one that established the government. God is the one that has ordained the government. Well, why did God ordain the government? Well, if you study the, 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 the history of Israel and all that they did, you'll notice that, his, that Israel had always been rebellious. They, especially going back to Exodus 32 when they made the golden calf. And Aaron basically said to Moses after Moses came down from Mount Sinai and and uh, and God wasn't having it. And so Moses came down from Mount Sinai and what did he see? A golden calf. And of course that golden calf was destroyed. And what was Aaron's excuse? Aaron's excuse was, oh well, it, we just we gave it its its bracelets and rings and all that and out popped this calf. But see, that's why God established the government, because God saw the rebellion of mankind. And a matter of fact, you go back to Genesis chapter 6, and it's not the fact that God is some genocide, homicide maniac. No, because God saw the evil that is in men's heart. And just in case if anybody says, oh, well, oh, Jesus would never say that. Uh, yeah, he did. In Mark chapter 7. He said, it doesn't matter what goes into the body, it what comes out of the heart. That's why, you know, with 
with the with the atheist viewers and the agnostic viewers, I would like to challenge them that you have to study the full context of the passage, and you can't just turn to Richard Dawkins. You can't just turn to these atheist professors because they will butcher it. I mean, just read about read on it from sources like from John Calvin, um, Dr. James R. White. And those guys who actually rightly interpret the Bible the way that it is. Because if you don't, you'll never get why God would do these things. So you have to study in the full context because there's many people who get stumped at Genesis 6 and 7 about the, the worldwide flood. And they will take that as God being genocidal. Well, no, that's not true because then you read back. And it says that God saw the, the wickedness that was in their heart. And then you go on, and then Jesus says the exact same thing in John chapter 2. The exact same thing, that he did not trust everyone because he knew what was in their heart. And what it's saying in Jeremiah 79, the heart is wicked above all else. Who can understand it? And in verse 10, I, the Lord God, test the hearts and the minds according to their deeds. And so because... God has established the um, – and by the way, really quickly, and when, you, and when you study the book of Judges, you notice, I believe, in, in Judges 20, 20, chapter 22, verse 15, you'll notice that it says there was no king in Israel during those days, and Israel did what was right in their own eyes. That's exactly why God established the government. That's exactly why. Because he knows that people are going to do – what they think is right in their own eyes. But no, that's why God established the rules. That's why God established the Ten Commandments. Because God knows the heart better than anybody else. We think we know better, but guess what? That's not true. God knows better. That's why we have to obey God's commandments. That's why we have to obey who God is. Because if we don't, then guess what? There's consequences. And trust me. I mean, let, let's take a practical example here. Let's, let's take, for instance, Dr. Phil. How, how many times have you seen on Dr. Phil where people, they always say this lie, and now I'm quoting. I just want to do what I want. Parents back off. I want to do what I want, what I feel like. That's exactly it. They're just, exa they're just acting exactly like, Israel back in the Old Testament. That's exactly it. There's nothing different. You see? You see how the Bible connects to nowadays and how we can apply it to nowadays? That's exactly it, folks. People want to naturally do what is right in their own eyes. People want to do what they feel rather than what they know. Have you noticed that lately? They don't want to, they don't want to obey the commandments of God. They just want to obey what their heart desires. And that's why we need to repent of ourselves and turn to the law of God. Not because, not because we're going to be saved because we obey these laws, as many religious systems have taught. But it's more like we obey God because he first saved us through his son, Jesus Christ. And now through the imputed righteousness, where it, which means he put his righteousness into us. And now we want to obey those laws. So anyways, so now because God has established the government or ordained the government, it goes on to say that therefore whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So you see, since God has established government, we are to obey it. Because notice it says, therefore whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. They have disobeyed the rules of the Lord. That's what ordinance means, is the commandments of God. And that's why, you know, when you rebel against police officers, they have the right to arrest you. Why? Because it's ordained by God. And so, see, when, when you rob a bank or when you... um. When you do something, when you do some sort of illegal activity, God uses the police officers to track you down and to arrest you because God ordained them to do that. 
See? And so that's how it all works. <clears throat> now, of course, you know, some police officers do abuse their, their God-given authority. But however, and and you know that and that and that's a sad thing. But however, in, in the midst of all of it, that doesn't mean every police officer is going to abuse people. That's not always the case. the The reality is is that the police officers are here for our good, and you'll see that later on in Romans chapter thirteen. So let's continue on. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Now listen to this. Do you, do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. So you see, the Bible here is encouraging us that if you want to be um, not fearful of the police, then do what is right in the eyes of the police officer. You see? You want to do what's right. Because the, the, their whole point, uh, the police officer's whole point is to punish evil. That's the whole reason why, folks. It's not, it's not because police officers are evil. It's because... They, they execute justice on the evil. Now, of course, now what I mean by evil is that now we have to make the category distinction here. Uh, now, when I say category distinction, we, I, what I'm saying is that we have to recognize categories. Because, see, here's the, th here's the other problem in Christianity I've noticed is that not a lot of people are trained to think. So here's what I mean by the category distinction, distinguishing categories. So when I say the police officer is not evil, I don't mean his sinful heart. What I mean is in the sense that God is using him in that sense, and therefore he's not evil in the sense of his God-given purpose, but rather good because God has established him, established him there because of God's sovereign decree from eternity past, if that makes sense, or what he has already planned for the future and for the present. And notice it says, and you will have praise from the same. So, if you notice when you start obeying the police and when you start obeying the government, um, have you ever noticed those stories where I'll give an example. I remember years ago, I think this was before I was born and I would probably existed. I'm, I'm trying to remember, but I remember when my grandpa actually saved a little girl from oncoming traffic and actually brought the little girl to the sidewalk. And I kid you not, the mayor of El Cajon, which is in California here, gave my grandpa an award. Yes, true story. An actual award from the mayor of El Cajon himself. So you see, that's what, that's what it means by you'll, you will receive praise from the same. You will receive rewards from the government. And that's why, you know, we, we are to be citizens. We are to be good citizens of a nation. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean you agree with everything the government does, but however you do what you can to be a good citizen. Because God established it, whether we like it or not. God is the one that established the government, and therefore we ought to obey the government. But now why? But if you do what is evil, be afraid, the rest of verse 4. For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger of, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So see, 
when you don't obey government, the police have every right to put you in jail, to tase you, and pepper spray you. They have the right. They are, in a sense, God's wrath and justice on earth. They are. If you don't believe me, then why does it say, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil? Which, which interestingly, you go back to Romans chapter 12 and notice it says, never take your own revenge, Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Notice this, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You see, so that's why. Another thing is that because vengeance is of the Lord, he will repay. And and and, and what is what is one of the groups that he uses to repay? The government. Yes, folks, he uses government. That's why, you know, that's why um when you know, somebody comes over to your house and starts harassing you. You could call the police. And boom. Now, what if they don't, now, what if they don't, you know, come in time? And, you know, what if he starts attacking you? Then we go to, you know, Ecclesiastes chapter three, where it says that there is a time for peace and there's also a time for war. So there are times where you will have to use self-defense. But in most cases, <clears throat> God has specifically instructed the government to punish evil. And when we don't submit to the government and we rebel against government, guess what? We bear the sword because it bears the sword for nothing. And sword here is the symbol for um, wrath or punishment or war. So, going on, therefore it is necessary, verse 5, to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Let me read that again. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Yes, that's right. Because of conscience' sake, and what? well, one of the reasons why for conscience' sake is because we pay taxes. Yes, guys, taxes are established by God. What did Jesus say in the Gospels? He said, give to Caesar what is to Caesar and give to God what is to God. That's exactly it, folks. We give. That's why we pay taxes. Tax. There's a saying that if you notice that says. Tax is theft. Uh, no, it's not. I argue it isn't because God is the one that also established taxes. Not a lot of people like that. See, this is why this is one of the most controversial passages today. Because not a lot of people are willing to deal with the reality that God has established government. He's established taxes. He's established all of this, guys. Now, why taxes? Well, think about it. Let's think logically here. Think about it. If everything wasn't taxed, what do you think people are going to do? They're going to steal. I mean, let's let's go back now to Exodus chapter 20. Why would God say... Why would that passage in Romans 13 talk about taxes? Well, think about it. People would steal. And what is one of the Ten Commandments? Listen to this. In, um, in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 12, Honor your mother and father, that your days may be prolonged in, in the land which the Lord your God gives to you. You shall not mutter. You shall not not mutter. <laughs> Sorry about that. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall 
not steal. And verse 16 especially, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And notice verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, why would he put all that? Because God established taxes. So we wouldn't do all that. That way we wouldn't steal from the store. <clears throat> that way, you know, we, do, we don't just end up being like a bunch of freeloaders <laughs> and be irresponsible. I mean, here's the thing is that back all the way in the beginning with Adam and Eve, nothing was taxed. But yet after the fall of man, after Adam, Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit, then after that, taxes came. Because why? God saw the hearts of men, and he, would knew, he knew why they do it. Oh, well, well, why would God make Adam and Eve when he, when he already knew what they were going to do? Um, because he's full of love and he's full of patience. That's why. And for those that complain that why would he make Adam and Eve, um, I would suggest you read Second Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 9, where it says, but, but don't forget this promise that with a thousand years is, 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 a, is a day is a thousand years to the Lord. And, 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 and he is not slow to his promise, as some people count as slowness. But he is patient with those, so he would desire for all men to come to repentance. That's exactly why, folks. He made Adam and Eve because he's love, so we could exist. That's why. We don't exist as fish or donkeys or apes or chimpanzees. No matter what anybody has told you, we are created in the image of God. But however, despite it, we're created in the image of God. We're still fallen human beings. And think of, and think about it. When you look at the mirror and notice how imperfect you are. That's why, folks, is that you have to realize that, okay, I sin, but, but I'm going to take 10 good looks at myself and 12 looks upon Christ. And when we, st and when we continually do that, We'll be encouraged why we are made in this world, why we're created in the image of God, and all that. So we have to be reminded of these things. And then he goes on to say in, in, start, in the rest of verse 6, for rulers are servants of God. Now, it's not only the fact that the government is established by God, but notice it says they are servants of God. 